So good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, which will begin shortly. This afternoon's webinar is uh, presented by Dr. Rachel Hawkes, whom I'm sure we all know as co-director of NSELP and um, director of international education at the CAM Academy Trust. Hi everyone, um, welcome to this session. My name is Rachel Hawkes, currently seconded from my trust, the CAM Academy Trust, um, to work as co-director of NSELP. But today, um, I'm going to talk about work that I'm still doing as part of the CAM Academy Trust um, on Key Stage 2 curriculum design. Um, I want to, to say a couple of things up front, um, which otherwise I might forget to say later on. So um, one of the, the questions people tend to have is uh, what about the resources and, and where can I get them? Um, all of the resources uh, that are in, are, are in this session are freely available. Um, there will be links at, at the end, um, web links for you to, to go and get them, or you can just go uh, rachelhawks.com and all of the resources are there. French and Spanish schemes of work and full lesson resources continue to be uploaded. Um, we are two years into to the work and we're nearly through. So by March, we will have all four years of the curriculum um, with lessons for every week and follow up activities already there. I want to say something about German. German is, is underway. Um, almost two terms completed and that will be fully available um, from from next September but but there are schools that are already setting out to teach it I'll share the links to that at the end of the session um, I just want to also give a, a shout out um, to the um, colleagues that I work with on this um, there's a there's a lot of work that goes into it it isn't just me I want to thank um, Paula Vasquez Valero who who is uh, the creator of the lead creator on the Spanish material, and she delivers CPD at, at two levels, year three, year four, year five, year six, and also um, on the French side to Marie Odile Guillou, who um, who you'll you'll see her actually at some point um, when I when I share some resources, um, is the voice uh, behind all of the resources, the the person that keeps me on track with my French um, because it's my it's my third language. Um, and and uh, an inspiration behind many of the resources. So um, this is this is a team effort, and and I want to um, give recognition to to all of the people that are involved. In terms of uh, the thought, the planning, the ideas, um, the systematicity that, that I'm going to lay out this afternoon, the lead principles and that the principles have been adapted and brought down um, to Key Stage Two from NSELP's work at Key Stage 3. NSELP um, doesn't have a remit for Key Stage 2 curriculum design, um, but you'll have noticed in the pedagogy review from 2016 that there are quite a lot of pointers that, that direct towards primary. Um, and I'll be, I'll be sharing how those interleave and interact with the national curriculum and also the Ofsted research review into languages teaching. So those thank yous uh, done. Let's, let's move on um, and have a look at, uh, at how this how this is evolving. So when we change things, uh, the main drivers for that are usually uh, a need to solve some problems and the um, opportunities that we want to see. So we might see that something's not broken, but we might see that there's a, a way to make it better or something might be a little bit more problematic for us and we're recognizing that there is a, a need to solve those, those problems. So in, in my case, in the trust, um, we had this local need for change. Um, we had mixed age classes, so three, four, five, six, in some of our feeder primary schools, but not all of them. So trying to produce a curriculum that actually worked for, for all of our feeders was, was an issue. And, and for, for about a decade, I hadn't really been doing that much with that. I'd just been saying, oh, well, please just, just adapt them to make it work. So I wanted to do more on that front. It had been more than a decade since we'd written our key stage two Spanish curriculum. So that was in need of just some revisiting, some refreshing, some rethinking. And we obviously had a change of a lot of change of staff and our trust had grown. So the the difference in teacher expertise um, had had grown as well. So we had teachers that had degree level Spanish or French and and also um, teachers who stopped at year nine and it was a while ago and, and they they felt rather less confident. So we had a mixture there. On the national front, we've got we've got the existing national curriculum program of study, which um, has absolutely amazing things in it. But 
there are some things that it doesn't have and and we'll look at that in a minute there was a a, a need for clearer definition about the overall content what to put in the curriculum the way in which we sequenced it and also um, what the outcomes would be um, at year three, at year four, at year five, at year six. So really thinking about progression within it. That was some thinking we needed to do. We then had the new Ofsted framework, no longer new. Um, and then since that time, we've also had the Ofsted research review into languages with obviously its, its work on the three pillars, um, which I definitely prefer to call strands, if that's okay. So our, when I say strands, you think Ofsted pillars, but, but we're talking about the same thing. And finally, um, and maybe we're thinking that this is far away from Key Stage 2. We had the changes that we've we've been seeing at Key Stage 4. Some, some teachers, there's no expectation that if you teach primary, you will necessarily be aware, aware of those changes. But we have a new, a new exam on the horizon, a new GCSE on the horizon, um, which is very different from the current one. Um, and the main difference is that the content has been very explicitly defined. So defined at word level. It's being currently defined at word level. So those things are big, um, big motivators for change. OK, so it's also really, really clear when you're sort of laying out a journey of how you've done something and also when you're setting out on that journey in the first place to be really clear about what you're trying to achieve. Um, about the principles that you're working to and about the assumptions that that you make. So um, these are the principles that that we are working to and the propositions that kind of guided us in our work. So the first thing is that we know that language learning at in classrooms in this country is time limited. There's no getting away from that. It's limited at key stage three, it's limited at key stage four, and it's limited at key stage two. It's also very variable at key stage two, but mostly in this, we're thinking about how, how limited it is overall. And in a scenario where time is limited, most of the learning that pupils do will be intentional rather than incidental. So by that, I mean planned, um, thought about, deliberate um, rather than sort of exposure or immersion and both types of learning exist and the Ofsted research review is really clear about that um, language learning can be both intentional and incidental and and actually is within a classroom there will be some incidental learning but the key word here is must uh, no not must the key word here is most most learning will be um, intentional and when learning is intentional, it's really helpful to have a set, um, a set of set informed and achievable expectations so that we know we know what content we are setting out for our for our learners to uh, to acquire. And and that in itself needs very, very careful planning and sequencing and revisiting. So one of the, the key things, obviously, that the words in in uh, uh, in quotes there, substantial progress. That is what sits within the national curriculum expectations that, that learners over their four years of key stage two language learning will make substantial progress in one language. Um, that, that in itself requires some definition um, and, and some real substance to it so that we can understand what that looks like and then plan towards achieving that. In our time limited framework, um, we, we're going to have a predominance of explicit learning. And the reason for that is that it levels up the opportunities for less naturally analytical learners. So we will have learners that can pick patterns out. We will have learners where we can say, what do you see there? What do you think? What could that be? Um, and that's, that takes some time and it can be very, very enjoyable um, uh, with, with many learners. But in a time limited, in a time limited scenario, um, there, is, there is substantial research that suggests that for most learners most of the time they will make most progress by explicit learning of languages in the in the classroom and that includes at key stage two that ties in with with the conceptual learning that is in full swing anyway um in literacy and numeracy by year three we're not we're not sort of saying uh, what do you see here what you what type of word do you think it might be we're, we are we are introducing pupils explicitly to uh, grammatical terminology to what those words are what they do in a sentence um, and that's in full swing by year three so it, it it's not inappropriate that we should be very uh, 
very meticulously planning um, our concrete teaching of, of grammar, of phonics and of vocabulary at Key Stage 2 from the very word go. We also consider very, very strongly that language in itself is, is a subject of fascination for pupils, that, that almost tasting the sounds of those words um, can be enjoyable. Hearing rhymes, um, practicing with rhythm, uh, seeing the patterns, fi find, finding them, having been told what they are, but, but still recognizing them and processing them is something that can be um, an object of real fascination for pupils um, at Key Stage 2 and also later. We also start from the premise that confident communication comes from a really, really secure knowledge of these sounds, of these words and of these patterns. So in other words, sounds, phonics, words, vocabulary, patterns, grammar, and that those three things weave in together um, and combine to make um, confident communication after a lot of practice and a practice based curriculum um, is going to be essential here to, to, to achieve those communicative goals. We also believe that culture is as interesting and important to primary learners as it is to, to language learners of any age. Adults, adolescents, primary children, um, culture is key, culture is important. We want to maximise our involvement with it and our engagement with it at language learning of all levels. And that creativity um, is, is broader than um, creating a poem or talking about an artwork, um, but creativity is actually in and of itself the act of putting language together, language that has been previously taught, but perhaps in another context, putting that together independently to create something new, whatever it is. The creativity lies in the act of, um, with volition, putting those words together. Um, one of the things that I absolutely love about being involved in this process is, is the contribution that, that people that come on board have made to the development of the scheme. So this has been going for a little while and last September um, several schools in our trust started teaching with it but also it was it was put online and made available to anyone and so there were schools that picked this up um, just because they found it online and started teaching it and then became part of the ongoing conversation. And this this bit that I've put in here um, from a school called St Peter's Primary School in Leeds, um, the teacher that picked up the Spanish scheme of work and has run with it, uh, wanted a little bit of help with with the sort of policy, um, a language learning policy for the, for the school that she was developing. And I sent some of this wording um, but the reason that I've shared it is that she she sent it back to me with her version and said, oh, I just added something. Um, we and, and the bit that she'd added is is that final sentence. A key focus is making friends and we refer to friendship sentences in our teaching. And when I got that, that back, I just thought that absolute genius. It's an absolute genius because because that's what we that's what we're saying that that languages are about. Um, languages are about communication, languages are about making connections between peoples that are from different places and speak different languages and actually what better way of bringing that home and making that a live concept for, for pupils at Key Stage 2 than having this, this very, very neat hook of friendship sentences to hang a lot of our language learning on from the earliest possible stages. So I've started building that in. Um, here's, here's one such slide. Uh, called friendship, um, where we where we introduce pupils to it from from early on in year three, and this is this is a, a recap slide um, where we're revisiting previously taught language, but we're doing that in the summer term of year three, year four, um, and this is some of the things that they've learned earlier on in the year. But we use this idea of friendship sentences to recap some of that language, um, and and again, I want to flag creativity here is often about spotting an appropriate moment to use what you know how to say um, in a different context. So culture is absolutely everywhere in language as well. So creativity is in that independent use in appropriate moments, that repurposing, and culture is absolutely everywhere in language as well. It's in the sounds, 
It's in the words themselves, it's in the grammar, as well as, of course, in the festivals and the places um, and the customs that we look at in the, in the actual content. When pupils learn bonjour and salut in our French um, scheme of work, they learn the difference in register that can be attached to them, that one is more formal than the other. And that sets the scene for then later learning about tu and vous. So much of this early language learning curriculum can be considered friendship, essentially making links, greeting someone, asking how they are. So we say this, we say learning language is, a, is about making friends. You show kindness when you learn even a few words in another language. Let's remember some of the friendship sentences we have learned already. Um, that signal there, that, that uh, emoticon or whatever it's called, is associated by the pupils with a greeting. Bonjour. And the other one, salut. And we might want to ask somebody how they are. Ça va. And what other kind things can we say? And this is where we get to revisit quite a lot of language because we'll find that most of the language that we learn in year three, four, five and six can be reconceptualized as, as friendship, as making contact with other people. So, are you pleased? It's perfect. You're my friend. I like your bag. I particularly like that one. You are nice. Tu es sympa. So, the, this is a this is a, a conceptual idea really about about how to to frame language learning um, so that so that pupils see it in terms of making these connections with people from the word go being kind and and actually you know there's a lot there's a lot that that we can do in in early language learning um, that is about the general socialization of being in school anyway let's return to the actual point of starting to plan the curriculum then. Um, Ofsted uh, Research Review says very clearly that, um, and, and, and cites a, a piece of research, a study, showing that um, the, the biggest demotivator for pupils, the biggest factor in their demotivation um, by the end of primary uh, and into the beginning of year seven is the lack of transition, so the lack of curriculum join up between key stage two and key stage three. And that's something that I want us to carry very much in, a, in our minds when we think about um, the whole issue of curriculum design, that it can't really sit in its own key stage two vacuum, that it needs to see the broader picture of key stage two into key stage three and ahead to key stage four. But when we start with key stage two, we look at the detail and this is the whole programme of study. So this is the key stage two programme of study. It, it doesn't look quite like this. It's not quite laid out like this, but this is the whole content. And, you know, what happens with policy is that um, this is the national curriculum. Then other things come out like the pedagogy review and, uh, and guidance documents. And then the Ofsted research review comes out. And as teachers, we go, oh, are these things compatible? Where are the areas of join up? Um, are there are there areas of ambiguity or, or areas of conflict? And actually, um, one of the things that we we find when we look at the Key Stage Two program study is that the three strands are absolutely there. They're not there with the words phonics, vocabulary, and grammar. Well, grammar is actually there. You can see that in the middle, but but they are very very definitely there, and we can and we can find them. So here you can see in blue. Um, that we've highlighted the phonics. So link the sound, spelling and meaning of words. That's definitely about phonics knowledge. And pupils are expected to be able to read aloud with accurate pronunciation. That's also about phonics. What about vocabulary? Uh, what, can, what can give us some pointers here about which vocabulary we should be teaching? Because this is the key stage two programme of study after all. Well, it says describe people, places, things. So that's a pointer towards content. That's a pointer towards vocabulary um, to describe people and places and things. You have to be able to name, first of all, pe people, places, things. So places and things. Uh, so that means nouns. So you have to, you have to know nouns and then to describe them. You have to put some adjectives with those nouns and people, places, things. So we're thinking of people, character adjectives, uh, physical description adjectives places we're thinking about sizes maybe modern international sort of words that could describe places 
but we have to put the meat on the bones of this because there there isn't anything above and beyond there's nothing that that helps us narrow to content and the other thing is that these are the outcomes these are saying at the end of key stage two pupils should be able to link the sound spelling and meaning of words but what it doesn't say is um, they should have been taught this phonic this phonic, this phonic, this sound symbol correspondent, this one, this one, this one, and they should uh, know this many by the end of year three, know this many by the end of year four, and be able to A, read them aloud, and B, write down words that they have not seen before, but that they hear and try and, and approximate their spelling. It doesn't give that level of detail. So in this vacuum, we've all gone about trying to populate the curriculum with things that we think should be there, um, but with this quite scant guidance about what those things should be. And even in terms of grammar, where I think there's a bit more detail, so we know gender of nouns must be there in order for us to be able to name things. Um, singular and plurals, well, yes, that stands to reason that, you know, if you've got one of something, you might also have two of it, so therefore we're going to have to pluralise. Adjectives, we're going to need to, to be able to describe people, places, things. We're going to need to know where to put those adjectives in the sentence and how to agree them, how their forms will change depending on the gender or the number. And in terms of conjugation of key verbs, that's perhaps the most vague. We could probably say, well, that definitely means have and are and is. So être, avoir or tener and uh, estar and ser definitely going to need to be in there. Um, but what other ones, what other verbs are key? How do we identify which ones those are? So there, there are some gaps there. Um, and we need to put some flesh on that bones, um, I think. And that's been one of the one of the things that we that we've tried to do. And I, I want to show um, how there are quite a number of things that can guide us rather than just our kind of latent ideas of things that have always been there or things that we think primary pupils might be interested in. There are other other factors. So in creating these new ones, we had existing old ones. Um, and so, and because those are on my website, and I do know that that, that uh, many schools are using them, um, I, I do get quite a number of emails saying, oh, I see you've, you've, you've created some new stuff. I really like your old stuff. I think I'm going to stick with that. Um, why have you created a new one? I think I, you know, I've put this slide in to just be a little bit clearer about what is the same and what is different so that so that teachers are fully informed about about their own curriculum development, but also if they want to pick up and borrow things, they know what they're borrowing and why. So the different scenario is that we have spread phonics out now. Phonics were always big in, in our primary curricula, but we front loaded them in year three. We did a big sort of burst of phonics at the beginning. And then we sort of came back to them when we needed them, I guess, or we relied on teachers to come back to them when they needed them. And we didn't uh, explicitly or in a planned way come back and revisit those. The new scheme of work spaces those out, spreads them out across all four years and revisits them systematically. So Ofsted's golden golden thread um, is, is about planning. It's planning, planning, planning. So um, revisiting everything and knowing what's been taught when, how many times it's been seen, how what you've done with it and what pupils can therefore be expected to uh, to retain, to know in any one given moment. So this revisiting systematically means in phonics that we revisit all of the phonics every year across Key Stage 2. All of the ones we teach get, get taught and revisited in the same year and then taught and revisited in the same year again. We didn't used to do this either. We didn't used to have unknown words included for practice or for assessment. So um, it, it just was something that hadn't particularly occurred to me. And I'm sure that incidentally, we did have many occasions where unknown words were um, sort of accidentally included in, in the activities. Um, and so pupils did uh, without a doubt, get some practice in, in pronouncing unknown words, but it wasn't done in a planned way. It wasn't specifically included that we would teach yeah, and then we would include some words with yeah that pupils didn't know in order to practice that pronunciation. And that's now 
that's now something that is part of the scheme of work. So the things that have stayed the same, we still teach the sound spelling correspondences in a source word with a gesture, and we practice that then with a bunch of cluster words. So libro will still be our word for L, uh, yeah, for the letter L, and we will still have a gesture, libro, and we will have llamar, llamar for the two syllables um, for the double L sound in the verb to call. Um, we practice those then in other words and we take care that those other words have the sound symbol correspondence embedded in different places in the word. So as initial, as a middle or as a final syllable, wherever we can, wherever that exists. We do still do read aloud and transcription practice because that is just logically the way you would practice the knowledge of phonics. In terms of vocabulary then, we've counted the words now. So um, I've been in teaching more than 25 years and until the last couple of years or the last three years of work with NSELP, I had never been involved in debates about how many words can we realistically expect pupils to learn for every week, for every hour of learning? Um, at the end of year three, what would that mean? At the end of year nine, what would that mean? What would their vocabulary be? How would we know that they'd still retained those? What What is reasonable to expect? So we now know quite a lot more about that. NSELP started that discussion. And in terms of primary, if we're thinking about um, an average of three to four words, over four years of learning and that that's based on that isn't just sort of plucked out of the air that's that's based on um, some research into what it's reasonable to expect learners to be able to learn for every hour of learning um, we would expect that our curriculum at key stage two could contain between 450 and 512 words that was nothing uh, that was not a consideration for our previous curriculum so important that we think about what's reasonable for the amount of time we're spending. And I will say at this point that um, this is based on the calculation of one hour's teaching at primary every year from three to six. And that in itself, that sort of um, aspiration, if it is an aspiration and you're thinking, well, we don't do that in my school, um, is, is the minimum requirement, uh, the minimum recommendation, sorry, um, in, the, in the Ripple uh, white paper. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about how, how that's structured and how we, how we do intend to deliver that across the curriculum. But one hour um, of teaching is what's informed this expectation of number of words that you could learn. Which words? Um, they're now informed by frequency. So why frequency? Well, because 90% of the communication, the oral communication, the, the conversation that occurs in any language um, where it's spoken, so French, German, Spanish, Italian, which, whichever language, 90% of the conversation is made up of words that are from the most frequent 2,000 words in a language. Um, and that, that's, that's um, factual, that's, that's been found to be the case. Um, and that feels important because if our aim is communication, then we would be wanting to replicate those those sorts of figures in our choice of of language in our curriculum. We wouldn't want to be teaching, spending a lot of our time teaching the really rare words that they're unlikely to use outside of their French classroom. We want to be equipping them with language that they're actually going to use in the future and going to use in the future at key stage three and going to use in the future at key stage four. And we'll come back to that one later as well. We have included in our curriculum spaced revisiting. So um, we've taken our cue from NSELP uh, and these, these are, there is no absolute data on how many weeks it's good to leave between, between your spaced revisiting. But what we do know is that spaced revisiting is important. So we teach words in, in a week that we'll call week one. In week four, so three weeks later, we would revisit those words. In week 10, so nine weeks after original teaching, they would be revisited again. And that's every single word that, that's taught will get those intentional revisits. They'll also have many other in, uninten not unintentional, but incidental revisits where they may be included, but they will for definite get those three revisits or those three visits, I should say, because the first one is obviously not a repeat. 
Things that have stayed the same though in our vocabulary is that we have kept many concrete nouns as, as they are appropriate to that age group and that, and that stage of development. I do, I do envisage that, that when you teach nouns, it's very, very helpful that people can, can put their hands on or can point to some of those nouns around the classroom to make a really visceral and physical connection to pick up un stylo, un crayon, um, I think is, is important um, and particularly at that concrete kind of learning stage. Yes, they are beginning to think abstract thoughts. Yes, they are beginning to get that formal education behind them and deal with concepts. But I think um, at, the, at the stage of learning where you're beginning to look at gender and, and nouns, it can be very, very helpful to actually be able to respond by putting your hand on something. And, and there are many activity types that still work extremely well. So we've kept songs, we've kept poems, we've kept games um, in, the, in the curriculum as we felt that was appropriate. In terms of grammar, we've made clearer links with primary English. 20% of learners in our country in primary schools are EAL. It's not just for them though, that we've included these clearer links with English. It's also um, about knowing and recognizing that, that many, many learners need more bites at the cherry than, than one or two. Um, they, their work in English literacy is reinforced by their work in languages. Um, and, you know, I know that I learned most of my English grammar from my German lessons. And I know that there are lots of, I'm not alone in that. Um, but that was at a time when, when in, in English education, in my English lessons, explicit grammar wasn't a thing. Even though it is now a thing in primary school, isn't that more the reason to, to make these clearer links when we're learning a, a foreign language to reinforce literacy across the board? Um, so we make clearer links with primary English. We make sure that there is knowledge there. We are, we are developing knowledge about language and, and language analysis that will serve pupils well when they go into Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4. And we are levelling the playing field by, by making those explanations of grammar features really, really clear and explicit. If we, if we lay things at, at pupils' feet and ask them to find the patterns, or if we don't even do that and we just sort of hope that they will find some patterns within it, there will be some pupils that do do that. And those pupils will be the ones that are naturally analytically um, gifted or proficient. It is possible to improve pupils' levels of analysis and their analytical ability through explicit explanation. Um, if we don't do it, a gap will open up between those that naturally can and those that naturally don't. Um, so we need to give the ex explicit explanation to level that playing field and help all learners have, have the opportunity to develop that knowledge. Um, I, th I think it's quite dangerous if we don't do that, because otherwise the gap between those that can and can't by the end of Key Stage 2 is massive and it, and it probably is a bit of a factor in terms of demotivation when they hit secondary school. Um, and, and we really do need them to be able to make to analyse language and to know um, explicit features at that, at that stage. So getting in early with explicit explanation um, is really helpful. We also have put in um, some input practice before production. So, and this is new to secondary as, as it is to primary. Um, in, in secondary uh, Key Stage 3 textbooks currently, you will see listening before speaking. You will see reading before writing is expected. But those listening and reading activities are much more general in terms of their focus. And actually, as some of them can bypass the crucial features of language. Um, so, for example, if you have a text where you, you ask the question, who lives in Colombia? and you think that you're asking them to process the word who or the word lives, actually they're just going to find the word Columbia and then they'll see the name and then they'll they'll guess what, what the question was asking and they won't have actually noticed that there was a verb in the sentence at all. And so, so some of the ways we ask questions and the ways we structure activities don't actually practice language. They're not really language focused. They're more global and a lot of them can be done by guesswork. Um, it's not really explicit enough. So, so recognizing this, and again, all, um, all kudos really to the incorporation of, of, of NSELP's work on explicit 
um, explanation and also then followed up by this input practice in listening and reading before we then um, have structured production practice. In terms of grammar, what's the same? The features are the same. So nouns, gender, number, articles, adjectives, verbs, high frequent, highly frequent irregulars, and the present tense regular verbs. Though, though that was that was in our old curriculum and that's in our new curriculum. So that hasn't changed. And the activity types in terms of wanting our pupils to interact, to ask each other questions, to answer questions, to describe things, those things have also stayed the same. Um, but now I want to show you some concrete, concrete examples. So of, of how we've gone about putting putting this together. I have never worked on schemes of work like this um, in this level of detail with this level of planning. Um, it, it is much, much more than I have have ever been involved with before. And I thought that the previous schemes of work um, that we had put together in my trust were very, very detailed and very, very thoroughly put together as well. But this is this is a, just a different level of, of thinking about planning. So the phonics repeat, as I said, um, if you're looking at a rather bewildering um, sort of uh, table there, you can see uh, week term one, that's the autumn term. Um, we have 14 weeks of teaching. You can see that there are quite there's quite a bit of slack put in at the end for revisiting. Um, and also we have some, some of those opportunities are then for assessment as well. But you can see the weeks in which there is new teaching and which there is um, consolidation. In week in term two, we just have 11 weeks and in term three, we have 13 weeks. It does mean that over the four years of primary, every single sound spelling correspondence has a whole week of practice plus an assessment. Um, so there are a minimum of eight intentional encounters of each sound spelling correspondence that we've identified at Key Stage 2. Um, French years three, four, five and six do not have every single sound spelling correspondence in the French language. They don't actually have every single one that's listed on the new GCSE specification for, for Key Stage 4. Um, and they are listed there. So that is where we should be taking our cue from, joining up Key Stage 2, Key Stage 3, Key Stage 4. There is a list of the French sound spelling correspondences that will be tested at age 16. So we should be we should be giving that some mind when we think about planning in our structured phonics to Key Stage 2. We haven't done all of every single sound writing relationship. We've done the ones that we think we can really uh, make a good job of at Key Stage 2. So we've left some uh, for teaching at secondary. So for example, GN, TH, the E sound, the I sound. And phonics activities, we have exploited them to the absolute max to give opportunities for, for incidental learning as well. So we want to, we know that a lot of this is about intentional, planned, meticulously planned practice, but we also know that pupils can pick up words that that they like the sound of, that kind of touch a, touch some kind of um, empathetic or effective uh, nerve in their brain or whatever it is that happens, a little spark that happens and that different pupils will latch onto different words at different times. So, so we do give them those sorts of opportunities by using those unknown words like we need to for practicing phonics in poems, in songs, in place names, in people names. Um, and that enriches the whole scheme of work. OK, so that's essentially what yeah. what um, the planning for phonics looks like in terms of an actual teaching resource. I think you must have probably just heard there. Yeah. And for French, we have uh, little video inserts. This is where I said you would see Mario Dil Guillou. Um, yeah. And very, very important, I think, with French, where some of the sounds are produced very differently. Some of them really don't exist um, in English at all. And we need to see the mouth shape and it's important and useful to see that mouth shape. And I don't know if, if um, any of you have these, but I know that there are, um, I used to really enjoy using these when I was teaching primary, little tiny, very, very cheap mirrors that pupils can then actually practice and see their own mouth shape um, in the mirror as they are practicing uh, the physiology, the sort of muscle memory of pronouncing these new sounds. So pupils can copy the mouth shape as well as listen and emulate the pronunciation. Yeah. This is 
ya, the sound, the sound symbol correspondence. This is our source word, bien. This bien. is our gesture, and our gesture that we use with our hands is bien. Um, and here we see bien, and we hear the whole word, the whole source word pronounced. And then I said that there were cluster words, so uh, words where we, we also practice hearing and saying and seeing and connecting the sound writing relationship. Bien. Chien. Chien. Bientôt. Bientôt. Ancien. Anc combien. Combien. So at this point where this is the phonics focus for this week, it could well be that a couple of these words have already been taught, so they might be familiar, but others of them might not be. So at this particular point in time, pupils have actually already met bien. They, I can't quite remember off the top of my head whether they've met combien, but they will, and they have met chien. They, they won't have met bientôt, and they won't have met ancien, but those are high frequency words in their own right. It just might be that the pupils hadn't learnt them and they might not be learning them at key stage two. But I have very much kept in mind um, the likelihood that they will meet them at key stage three and key stage four. And that's how the frequency helps us um, to keep all of these choices extremely rational and well thought through. Now, one of the things that I said about, about phonics was that we need to pronounce unknown words and we need to hear and, and identify the sounds and match the sound and the spelling and the writing with unknown words. So in this particular week when we're, when we're practicing ian, we contrast it with a, and actually those are, those are fairly tricky. That demands quite, um, quite good attention on the part of pupils. And um, we are in the zoo, so this is our context for learning. Now, these particular words here will not be vocabulary words. They're not, they're not highly frequent words. The word Dalmatian, the word penguin is not super frequent, but they are the sorts of words that some pupils will, will go away from the lesson and, and know. So babouin might actually be something that a pupil acquires because they want to or just because it, it sits in their head and they remember it. And that's absolutely fine. But the point of these words here is that they are for listening and identifying the difference um, in the sound writing relationship in the phonics. So, so we have, for example, um, we would listen and we would decide, are we hearing ia or are we hearing a? And you might not be hearing that because I'm not hearing it at the moment either, but underneath anything that's in the scheme, in the uh, resources, underneath anything that's got a shading to it, like any button, there is always audio inserted. So, uh, penguin is there, felin is there, chien is there, and again, no harm if there's one that's going to be a little bit easier for them. Requin is there, and so they pupils would be listening and deciding for each one. There's an awful lot of contrasting pairs so that we're not overloading pupils cognitively, but we are really concentrating their minds and their attention on, on small differences in sound um, that make a, a, a concrete difference in the, in the word. And one of the things about phonics is that very small sound differences can, with certain words and within certain sentences, make a big difference to meaning. So for example, in Spanish, um, I eat is como, he ate, she ate, or it ate is como. Just a difference in stress makes a difference in tense and makes a difference in person meaning. A lot of difference in meaning for one tiny little sound. These The phonics activities really are very, very good awareness raising, very, very good attention focusing activities on, on those details, on those very, very tiny sound writing differences. A little bit of culture comes in here. Um, I don't know if you know, but le scorpion longue de sien is, is a yellow scorpion that lives um, in the Languedoc region in France. Um, again, ex again, we can practice saying words that we don't know. We can practice also a little bit of um, understanding with some unknown words, not in a, in a very time intensive way, because most of our learning is going to be intentional. Most of our vocabulary is going to be carefully counted and practiced. But it is good in, in cultural uh, moments to extend that sometimes. We will have pupils who have got that curiosity, that, that ability to make links between words they have in English 
mortel, for example, they might know mortal, they might not know mortal at, at this age, but some, some will have these um, extensive vocabularies that they can begin to draw on and make links. So we need to open, open the opportunities for that without letting it dominate, because for the majority of pupils, for the majority of the time, we need to be thinking about um, a very concrete number of words that we want that we want uh, pupils to acquire. So here we're still in the zoo and we're going to practice reading aloud now. We've done some listening, we've done some identifying of, of whether it was a or ya, and now we're going to practice producing that. So um, we have Eugenie who is going to go around the zoo and when we and when she arrives somewhere we are going to say the animal that she's visiting. So again it's a very simple activity moving the, the uh, location marker and pronouncing the name of the animal she's visiting. Again, obviously these are all unknown words. These are not on our vocabulary list. These are not for testing. These are not for um, acquiring. These are not part of the 450 to 500 words that we're learning. These are purely and simply um, for the practice of, uh, of the sound writing relationship. In vocabulary then, how um, how many words? And we and I said before that, that the discussion about how many words is reasonable is, is a relatively new one um, to modern languages. And, and there is evidence that informs it, which is really, really useful and important to take account of. So we've done that and we've, we've said how many words. We're choosing the words and we're frequency informed, but we're not we're not frequency dominated to the point where we don't also recognize that we need some of those concrete nouns as well that are familiar. We've planned in the revisiting, but we've got a number of activity types. We Actually, anything that's in the teacher's repertoire with vocabulary that really works, there are so many activities for vocabulary. We all have our favorites, whether it's using flashcards, whether it's using gestures, uh, whatever it is, whether it's moving around, um, we have so many activity types. As long as we know what we're aiming for, are we just aiming for word recognition? Are we aiming for full comprehension? Are we aiming for production? And if we're aiming for production, is it about spelling or is it about saying the word? We need to practice all four of those um, and, and often, but as long as we're doing that, there's, there's a lot, there's no limit to the variety of activities that we can include. In the resources, we include plenty of activities, but teachers should also feel that they can ring the changes and bring their own repertoire to the table. And that's important. One of the things that um, I just want to say about Key Stage 4 is that we do know now um, quite a lot of the words that are definitely going to be needed for Key Stage 4 for the GCSE. We will soon have a word list provided by all of the different awarding bodies. Um, two of the awarding bodies are working on theirs right now. One of the awarding bodies has, EDUCAS, has said that they are going to use the NSELPS example list. Um, and that means that I have been able to do planning um, along the lines of um, knowing, well, I've been able to do some analysis of our scheme of work to see um, how many of those words overlap. So whilst I know that I was heading for 80% of words to be from the most common 2000, I also now know that the overlap between our key stage two list of words that pupils will know by the end of key stage two overlaps with the NSELP and EDUCAS GCSE word list to the tune of 92%. So that means that um, there are only around between 30 and 50 words on either the French, the German or the Spanish scheme of work, it's different for all three, only that many words that you would learn over those four years that wouldn't then be useful to key stage three, well not just useful but essential for key stage three learning and key stage four learning and that to me seems to be a very very helpful step forward in terms of transition, the overlap being more than 92 percent of the key stage two curriculum and the GCSE um, end point. And we've talked about revisiting. So again, how to teach vocabulary? Count the ways, so many ways, songs, rhythm, gestures, rhyme, listen and respond, read and respond, sock puppets. If you love it, you love it. Use those still. Any apps that you've got, write in the air, write on your sleeve, write on the table, write on the new whiteboards. So many different things that form part of our repertoire. All of those 
um, and that list should be reassuring that despite the elements in this session that suggest potentially some quite radical content rethinking, there are so many elements of continuity there too in terms of the pedagogy. Um, the first thing that I was asked for pretty soon was uh, into this process of creating was a, a knowledge organiser. Um, and, you know, for me, the jury's out a little bit on on when to use these. I would far prefer that these were used after the learning took place rather than all the way along, because I, I have reasons for preferring that. However, I'm in Ply Plymouth at the moment. I've just spent a whole day um, with primary colleagues and uh, and one of the primary colleagues that was giving her voice from the classroom who is using this scheme of work uh, made a really cogent case for for using them as part of the learning as you go as you go on so i'm not going to be uh, too adamant about that because i think there are there are different rationales but it would just need to be thought through when when to give these and which use to make of them and also very very important for retrieval to not be using them all the time because there must be this element of struggle there must be the sort of brain retrieving the words rather than just seeing and recognizing and then feeling that you know but that being quite superficial a bit of a veneer of having learnt them rather than actual knowledge itself you can see from the from the knowledge organizers that um, the, the culture is represented as well in in, in spring term um, we've, we start off with uh, with information about about New Year um, and things we might be saying and things that might be a little bit different from how we how we think of, of January in, in, in England. We then go into other things which are relevant to this spring term. So we have a week on Le Carnaval de Montan, which is an absolutely amazing fruit, citrus fruit festival. Um, and obviously, uh, well, obviously, but La Chandeleur fits very, very nicely in the spring term as well. If we are starting with the language as the guiding point, and we might be saying, for example, hey, we're not going to teach all the colours at once in a bunch, because if we do, what we're going to be doing is building in some unhelpful and undesirable difficulty there. I don't know if, if anyone can immediately say how many adjectival patterns actually um, exist if you teach French colours, but, you know, quick count would say at least five different patterns of adjectival agreement. Why would we want to teach five patterns all at once? Um, we wouldn't really. So so then we wouldn't really shine a light on those so much. Uh, we would just teach, teach them as words, but then we wouldn't be able to use them in sentences. To use them in sentences, we need to know how their forms change when we when we describe things. And we know from the national curriculum that pupils should be able to describe things. So we know we need to use those adjectives with nouns and therefore we need to know their agreement and their placement. So what would we do then? Well, we'd probably not teach there and noir at the same time, because even those two that acquire an E are different. They're materially different because of the sound. It may be the same thing you do to them, but what you do to them has a different effect. So vert becomes verte, but noir becomes noir, essentially indistinguishable. So it, it demands a little bit of a, of a rethink about how to group words together for, for the clarity of the teaching. And if we, start, if we start making our decisions because of the language and the features of the language and the patterns and the clarity and what makes sense to learners, um, we are going to lose those sort of lines that we've currently drawn around clumps of vocabulary that we call topics, so colours all together. But it's important to do that um, because I, I would suggest that it's more important to teach words in such a way that more of the learners can grasp hold of them and use them and only a few of our learners will be able to cope with five patterns at once. Um, so that, that feels important to me. If we're going to lose the culture, uh, not the cultural thing, if we're going to lose the focus, the tight focus that comes from having a topic such as colours that we're going to teach, what can we use then to, to make our lessons seem cohesive and joined up? Well, one of the things that we can do is borrow um, narrative and to have a story. And the story elements, when you've got characters 
that repeat and come on and off and do things. It can be their birthday. It can be the grandma's birthday. It can be a day in school. It can be a new teacher and, and a difficult experience, a difficult week that you have with that. It can be a messy bedroom. It can be the daily situations that happen to our characters. They create that continuity without us having to do colours in one lesson that gives the continuity. They give familiarity to the whole scheme. They join the language up and they're also a cultural springboard because our characters can go places and they can see things and they can have aunts that live in Canada or whatever. So we provide stories within stories even and dream sequences and, and by, by providing a narrative backdrop, you get a real sense of, of how things can join up. So for example, we have, um, this this is a particular week i think it's term three it's blue so it's it's a year five six so it's an upper key stage two and we've taken la tomatina as our as our starting point and i won't have to have time to go into all the little bits of the lessons but i want to get to the bit where we oh, i want to get to the bit where we look at um where we look at the grammar because that's something i want to shine a light on so la tomatina is the context and every part of this lesson, whether it's the phonics, whether it's the vocabulary, or whether it's the grammar, will all be tied in. Even if it's the revisited vocabulary, it will be tied in with this theme. So we've got a text to start off with, and actually we've got um, some new words here that we're presenting. Generally, we might present new words individually, but we are in our third at least year of learning here. So we present um, these words within a text as their as their initial initial thing um i won't dwell on that bit but here we can see that bunyol if you know it is the site of la tomatina and we've taken a street map of bunyol and we've taken some of the the names of the streets out of it which have um accents on them and we know that when we see an accent in spanish we have to pronounce and stress that particular syllable. So pupils practice that. It's a phonics activity, but it's set within our context of the town where La Tomatina takes place. Again, I won't dwell on that one too much. And now we get to what we're revising. So it says remember here. And when it says remember, it means we've learned this before. This may be the sixth or the seventh time that we have practiced um, the difference between he, she, it with a verb and they with a verb. And the difference in Spanish with an AR verb is the presence of an N or not an N. So it's either A on the end for singular or AN for plural. And again, our examples are gonna be new examples because they're from the context of what we're doing this week. So tira tomates, what can that mean? She, he throws tomatoes. Tiran tomates, what could that mean? They throw tomatoes. So again, we're putting, this is the explicit explanation. We don't want pupils to write this down because they're going to practice with this knowledge in less than a minute's time. We're going to be, this is to heighten awareness, to give ourselves a doorway into practicing. And here we've got the same, but with the ER verbs that we're revising this week too. Now, don't know if you know this, but La Tomatina Infantile is a children's version. I didn't know there was a children's version of La Tomatina Festival, but there is. Um, I imagine that after this lesson, all pupils will go home and, want, um, and be pestering their parents to go and take part in it. Um, but this is La Tomatina Infantile. And what we want to know, because our characters are going to this festival this weekend, we want to know whether this is something that Sofia and Kike are doing, or whether it's something that only Sofia is doing. And the only way that we can tell this is by looking at the verb and processing the rule that we've just been told. So we've just seen and we've just been reminded that verbs with an N will be they. Verbs with an A or an E on the end will be he, she. So we have a look and we can make those decisions and we can make them relatively quickly, but we can only make them by looking at the detail that tells us that information. It's very, very, very um, focused. It's very, very, very about the pattern. And it's the sort of thing where, as I was reminded today when I was doing a similar session, that, that year 11 will, will be making mistakes with right now um, in the autumn term. We can get in early and we can really practice and we can really uh, make some progress in this direction. 
But we also need to understand it as well. We're not just reading to identify for pattern. We also want to process for meaning. So what do what do all these sentences mean? Every single word in these sentences has been learnt previously. So we are bringing back vocabulary from year three, from year four, or tomates, which has not been taught at all, is a cognate. But you can see that the only word that I've needed to give pupils the meaning of is the goggles. So who is it? Is it they and what are they doing? So they are in Bunyol for Tomatina kids. Who's reading the instructions? She's reading the instructions. She prepares the bag. They drink water. So each reading activity will have a stage where it's focused on the form and the meaning of that particular form. So the detail, which is the N, AN meaning, EN meaning, or A or E meaning. But then we're going to understand more globally. And this is all in the context of this visit that is taking place. This is what happens before they get to the festival. And now they're going to get to the festival. And what are they doing at this point? So then there is a listening where, again, we're going to listen to each phrase and decide whether they're both doing the activity or only Kike is doing the activity. And then we're going to understand what, what are they doing? Not just who's doing it, but what are they doing? But, but there's a little bit of support here. So who runs through the streets? Who takes the photos? Who's really pleased? Who swims in a sea of tomatoes? Who cleans up the streets afterwards? Who's nervous at the start, et cetera, et cetera. It then goes into, into some writing um, and then it goes into some speaking as well. All around the same theme, all practicing the same language, but making sure we're practicing the language across all four skills in a, in a very, very uh, particular way that, that makes the key feature, which is the verbs that sit underneath um, the, main, the main focus of the learning. Um, I hope I've explained that well. That's, that's an example of one lesson. Um, there obviously are lots and lots and lots, but I wanted to give um, something that showed you, and hopefully you saw just now, that we've seen that these elements that were in that, these grammatical elements that were in that lesson um, do the following things. They, they build links with English. They, they teach knowledge about the language and um, they prepare all learners with, a, with an essential um, foundational framework of language analysis. And we do that through explicit explanation, through this input practice. So that means listening and reading, practice of processing the grammar, where the, the grammar, the feature is absolutely essential. You cannot do the task without paying attention to the bit that we want them to pay attention to. And then in the end, we're also trapping that same form in the speaking and the writing. Um, I'm just going to include um, I, I didn't mean to talk through these anyway, but I've included some um, research evidence that that really talks very cogently to this idea of, of levelling up. Um, and, and essentially, if you look there where it says about the summary, uh, the third one down, metalinguistic ability, so this analytical ability about language, can be improved through instruction meaning that, that you are going to narrow the gap. It leads to less variation in performance between lowers, learners with a higher natural level of analytical ability and lower learners with a lower natural level of, lingu ling of language analytical ability. Gosh, can't even get my words out now. Um, more, more about the importance of language analysis and, and explicit teaching um, are provided from both those links there. And on this slide, I'm going to pause with questions. I said I would uh, tell you where the German resources are. Um, those are a little bit behind the French and Spanish just because we started them later, but they are um, accessible via those links for the year three, four and the year five, six resources if you want to um, access them. And they are being hosted on, on, a, um, on a new web page, new website, um, which belongs to Reading University because um, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Rowena Kasprovich, is, is, is doing uh, a longitudinal study of, of language learning and progression across uh, and progress within languages. So not progression, progress within languages that learners that learners make. It's, it's going to track learners over over four years of study and potentially also see some of them through into year seven. Very exciting study. It's just starting. 
Um, if you follow those links, you'll be able to read about that study. It is French, German and Spanish. If you are really interested and you'd like to get involved in some way, then her contact details will be on the website. Please do so. If you teach German, we'd be particularly interested to hear from you um, because we've got a couple of spaces still for, for project schools that teach German. I, I, would, I would expect that if you're desperate to be involved and you teach French and Spanish, there might still be a space for you as well. So, so do, do follow those links and read up about that study because it's, it's going to be really exciting and meaningful. Um, French and German resources, French and Spanish resources are on my website. And I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. I'm aware of the time. I know we got started a little bit late as well. And I know that I've used my full time. Um, and so absolutely fine if people want to, to go, of course. I mean, you, you don't need my permission to go. You can go whenever you like. Um, but if people want to stay, if there have been any points that people would like to raise or any questions, um, then I, I'm around and I'm staying here for as, as long as need. So, um, over to you, Elaine, to let me know if there are any people still in the building and if anyone wants any, <laughs> um, anyone has got any questions for me. Yes, thank you very much, Rachel, for that um, and that very insightful session, superbly presented as, as ever. Um, and um, again, we'd just like to apologise for any technical issues that we did. We've had this evening. It's the first time we've ever had that. It's just just how it is isn't it you know what it's like when you're working with computers yes we have had some questions actually um one from um julia who's actually you've answered that one rachel it's about um how can they manage to get some information about the courses and you've 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 already said about the two colleagues that are available to do those sessions and um, yeah. are they is it easy to find those emails addresses to be able to contact them right so if if i flick back to this one if you follow either of those two QR codes, it will take you to a flyer about okay. the courses. And on the bottom of the flyer, there's an email address um, that you would use to register interest. Um, those two courses are not free. Um, uh, you know, fess up now. Um, they are just the teachers do need paying for for their additional time, um, but we've kept it to an absolute minimum. Um, it's it's seventy five pounds for the three sessions. They will be recorded so you can go back to the session as often as you might need to in order to sort of refresh yourself. Um, uh, it, it's as reasonable as we can as we can make it. Um, if you're interested, then then do, do do follow the links on those flyers. I really would um, recommend a three session. It's not loads of time to give up for it, but it really will give you um, everything you need to get started in, in teaching the course and not just get started, but to get started and carry on. Um, and really, really superb colleagues. They ran a course last year, so it's not the first time they're doing it. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, another colleague um, who's anonymous has asked the question, would the resources be appropriate for years one to six? So instead of just starting in year three, would you would you consider, Rachel, that the resources for French, Spanish and German or any of the languages would be able to be tweaked to be able to be taught in years one and two as well? Yes, but not in not in their schemes as as the entirety. And one of the reasons I'd say that is that I think um, and and this is not sort of I can't say this standing on firm foundations with with evidence behind me, but all of all of the colleagues that I've that I've talked to generally don't do writing with with year one. Um, and therefore, if you're not doing writing with year one, phonics ha has has a different thing going on for it, doesn't it? You can you can you can practice the sounds of the language, but if you're not going to be writing them down, do you need to see them in their written form? At what point is that? At what point is that helpful? Um, I've had the debate with with primary colleagues about um, should we give them a little bit of time for for English phonics to get fully developed and fully embedded? It has felt right, and, and a lot of these things that we don't have secure evidence informed answers for have to be about intuition. I wouldn't ever say don't do, and I would love to know if people have done and then and then want to come back and say, well, actually, I've used the scheme with year one and brilliant. But my instinct is that I wouldn't start there. I would I would start at key stage one um, with building up vocabulary, yes. Um, and using gestures to do that and using songs to do that and joining in and, and, and some some reading probably, but not necessarily the kind of explicit uh, revisited 
uh, week by week phonics um, phonics layer. I think there is there is good time to do that at key stage two, but I think you can pave the way for really really good explicit learning by I guess what I'm saying is slightly more incidental, slightly more implicit um, uh, learning at key stage one, where certainly writing isn't to the fore. So it wouldn't I wouldn't be sort of saying an equal use of all four skills. But I have to say, and you're seeing that I'm sort of couching this with some caveats is key stage one is not my area of expertise, whether it whether it be sort of from a research um, angle or, or from a practitioner angle. I've done all my teaching at key stage two, key stage three, key stage four, key stage five and adults. So I haven't actually done more than an assembly with key stage one. So that really isn't my area. And maybe there are, are, are other people um, here that could put drop their contact details in, into the chat and, and get in touch with, with you anonymous if they if they can help and if you can sort of take that conversation further. But I will say not totally my area of expertise, but I am interested in any practice that, that any of you all have to share if, if uh, that could be another session, but maybe with me not as the lead. <laughs> Thank you for being honest there, Rachel. Uh, just to come back to that CPD course, um, Rosanna's asked, is the cost is the cost of the course per delegate or per school? Because they've got several members of staff who teach French in the school who would be interested in attending. Um, it, it is it is per delegate um, as it stands at the moment. What, what's interesting is we don't want to do anything other than meet our costs. So I'll tell you upfront that if 11 people signed up, we would then have met the costs so that we could run the course. And any others from that that, that wanted to latch on, we wouldn't really be that that um, worried about having extra people. But we do need to at least cover costs. So in order to in order to see whether it runs at the moment, we're, we're saying per delicate. But what I would say is as you as you reply to the email and sign up say and Rachel said that if we if we hit the minimum number that my other colleagues could join as well we will record the sessions so if you are if and they will be accessing accessible to you as a as a, a paid up delegate so whatever happens you you could then you know cascade them and that will be important because there will be other people that will say well my colleague would like to come too but she picks up her children at that particular time of day so there will be some flexibility and i i don't have i don't have financial money raising interests in this we just literally need to cover the costs of these of these teachers time in in providing this because I, I feel that 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 is just absolutely bottom line reasonable but there is absolutely no uh there's no desire to make money and to make a profit from this. So therefore, just uh, if you can get the agreement from your school, sign up and then list all the other people that you would like to attend. And I will I will collaborate with Lorraine, who will be taking these um, taking these sign ups and then we'll get back to you um, and, and work a way through that, if that's OK. Yeah, good to hear. Um, we had one question, our first question actually, really early on in the session from someone called Ruth. Um, and she said, why are the gestures not in Makaton? Yeah, interesting. Well, um, <laughs> well, because there are some that there, there are some different sort of strands and and different inspirations going on there. Um, they could be in Makaton. I, I I'm not an expert in Makaton. What what we have done with the French gestures, and I think it's the French course that's done this. Um, uh, and, and that should be me and I should really know, but I'm beginning to conflate the different courses um, in French. We have used we've actually used British sign language um, as the source of as the source of inspiration for for the signs. Um, and I was aware at the time that British sign language was was a, is still actually acquiring quite a lot of attention. Um, and there there are there's potentially going to eventually maybe be a GCSE in British Sign Language. Um, it, it is because it is becoming more more prominent. And so I I thought it would be a good idea to use it. Um, I, I know Makaton is is also um, something that that primary schools um, use. But at the time of writing, um, I used BSL instead for the French. For the Spanish, we had our Spanish scheme of work that had gone back a lot of years, a lot of years, and a lot of the 
um, teachers that I was writing for in the trust had experience teaching the phonics with gestures and they already had those gestures in their heads. So with those, there was a bit more of a continuity agenda, if I'm honest. Um, the gestures are only suggestions. So uh, the gestures never appear on screen. So you're not bound by the, the gestures at all. You can you can impose any gestures on, on these with pupils that, that you want to. Um, in, you know, in fact, when I first started writing, uh, I was thinking, well, you know, is it is it not for me to say just you know, use whatever gesture you think is appropriate? But in the end, I was asked for gestures. I have been asked to video myself doing gestures and things like that. So I thought, well, I'll put in what the gestures are. The British Sign Language has a website with a video dictionary where they have little videos so that me describing, you know, put both hands like this or do this like this. Actually, when you describe it in words, you can get quite, you can tie yourself in knots trying to imagine it. So wherever possible, I've put in a web link showing a videoed person doing it. Um, I didn't research Makaton, so I don't know if such a, a video dictionary exists for Makaton. It's a great idea. Um, it's a lot, it's a similar idea to using British Sign Language, but but it's it's absolutely great. And I'm not an expert on Makaton and, and the differences between that and, and British Sign Language, if I'm honest. I just know um, that it comes earlier generally in pupils development. So um, use whichever gestures you like. Even better if you can signpost me to a video dictionary and I can put a note underneath that says teacher's suggestion is that you might use Makaton for this. Um, and then away we go. Room yep. for variety. Um, and that's the other thing that really needs stressing is that these are in PowerPoint for a reason. They are meant to be taken by teachers, used by teachers. You can take a bit of them. You can take all of them. You can take nothing. You can you can do whatever you like. Um, acknowledging the source, but but creating your uh, your own approach that's that's best for you in the context of your school, because all of our schools are very, very different. Yeah, certainly are. Uh, we just got a couple more questions, uh, Rachel, if you're OK with that. Um, someone Fine. called Fiona has said, you mentioned the number of words is based on an hour of teaching per week. What would you recommend if the school timetable only allows for 30 to 40 minutes? I'd recommend you petition your school for a full hour. Obviously, I have to say that um, just from the point of view of uh, of what's realistic to learn. I think you'd have to reduce the number of words. Um, if you still wanted to teach the scheme of work, you'd probably just need to reduce the number of words that you expected pupils to, to really learn and retain and be able to write and be able to say, because obviously we know production is a step beyond um, comprehension. So you'd have to moder moderate your requirements um, of pupils there in terms of the assessment. Um, what One of the things that I didn't have the opportunity to say is that we teach, I, I've organised this scheme of work to be one lessons one 30 minute lessons teaching and then there is a separate powerpoint which is five separate follow-up activities that are five minutes long so so one of them is is a little bit longer it's 10 minutes so it makes an hour's teaching altogether but the lesson powerpoint the initial sort of bunch teaching bit is 30 minutes and then there are these follow-up activities and the reason that i've done that is that a lesson learning languages at Key Stage 2, in my mind, is not optimal at one full hour, all in one go, and that's all you get for the week. I think it's much better to have a chunk of time and then to have follow-up activities. Now, if you're saying to me that you've got a lesson of 30 to 40 minutes, then I would be saying, brilliant, that's your lesson. And then could the, the teacher of year three, in the cracks that I know open up in the day, whether it's before lunch, whether it's after lunch, whether it's register time in the morning when we're deciding whether we've packed lunch or not. Could could there be a five minute start the day activity that refreshes some of that language? Some of them aren't even a full five minutes. Some of them are, um, but a phonics activity can last two minutes and still be valuable. Um, so there are the so that's the way I plan the curriculum. If you go and download it, you'll see one thing says resource and the other column says follow up and the follow up is five separate activities. So I'd say You've got 30 to 40 minutes. All you need to do is convince the class teacher that they absolutely could commit to doing a five minute activity, call it three to five to make them um, a little bit more amenable. Maybe um, they'll soon get the bug and realize that that this is how pupils can really retain stuff over time is having that drip, drip, drip um, exposure to it. Thank right. you for that question, because that's helped me uh, remember that very crucial point that I didn't say. So thank you for that. 
No, that's fine. And the very last question is from Lawrence, who said, is there any advice on how to start with key stage two with the scheme of work? Should we start with the red with all years or can we start where we want? Oh, and that's a really, really good question. Thank you for asking that one. Um, it depends where you're starting from. If you haven't had anything much going on in languages, um, so, you know, you'd find it hard to say what they actually know. They might be in year six, but they may have had a, a disrupted experience. We've all had disrupted learning anyway over COVID. I know that um, in a lot of areas, languages took a backseat as we tried to fill in the gaps from, from that COVID closure time. So if you'd say, gosh, if I put my hand on my heart, year six don't, don't know anything right now really very much, then I'd say, yes, start everybody, start everybody on the red because it, it's structured, you will be able to pass on a concrete amount of knowledge, whether it's a smaller amount than ideally would be the case is neither here nor there. We're all starting from where we're starting. So no shame in starting with year three and then building up from there. And in four years time, your year threes will be in year six and they'll have had four years and then you'll be able to see the difference. If though you've been doing um, a different scheme, but you like the, the thought of the structure on this one, um, and the planning that's gone into it, et cetera, et cetera, then it really is a question of mapping their prior knowledge. Have a look at the year, um, the year five, six materials. Look at that, look at a few of the lessons and say, oh, my, my year fives could do that, actually. My year sixes could do that. There are a few words that, that they don't know. So put those words on the slide, put what they mean on the slide. Um, but it, if you think, gosh, they couldn't do that, they couldn't do that, they couldn't do that, then again, your answer is start with the year three, start from the beginning. Um, in my in my trust, we've all started at dif different stages and I and there's a bit, there's a whole paragraph that I put in the policy document that there's a link, there's a link to on the website, the policy document we've used. And there's an adaptable paragraph for our primaries to say, this has been our pattern so far, this is what we're doing, and this is how we're transitioning to a point where we do have a four year joined up curriculum. But at the moment, all of our year groups are doing this all of our year or two of our year groups are doing this. So you all you need to do from an offset perspective is not is is actually just have a rationale for what you're doing. And that rationale should be based on what pupils already can do, because there's no point trying to build a year, um, a third year primary learning curriculum on on a foundational basis that's not there. So start start with year three if that's the case. Thank you very much, Rachel. That's great. No 